What is it that man does not control yet? Time. We have learned to measure time precisely, and we have analyzed and studied it in our most profound philosophical reflections. But all our studies have not helped us to control something as simple as giving birth when the conditions are most appropriate, or remaining in a death-like state for years and reviving when life is possible. Man does not know if time is real or if it is an entelechy. It could be that we live so fast that we can't feel it anymore. We're satisfied just seeing it pass by. Other living beings seem to have a closer relationship with time. Many of them have very precise and amazing inner clocks that they can advance or delay at will. It's likely we stopped listening to those clocks thousands of years ago. It seems to be the time for the kites here on the Okavango River. We've been traveling around Namibia and Botswana for weeks, and we haven't seen any of them before. But all of them are here. We don't understand the reason for such a mass grouping, but it's clear these kites are waiting for something. In just a few seconds, the air filled with reasons. The reason was that out of the thousands of termite mounds, winged princesses and males began to emerge in search of a new kingdom. It's their moment. It's the appropriate time to mate and to start new termite mounds. The right temperature, humidity, and sunlight have triggered their hormone timer. But undoubtedly, the strangest thing was why these kites were there. They were waiting for them. These birds have come exclusively to feed on kings and queens. They have synchronized their timer with the insects. They knew the time and place for their yearly appointment with the termites. And the kites were right on time. Their efficiency showed that this was not the first time they were on such a hunt and that they were not there by chance. In less than an hour, the termites had stopped flying up and the kites scattered again all over the territory. We didn't find them again. There is no man-made computer with enough parameters to parallel the accuracy that rules the skies at the Tropic of Capricorn. The natural ability to wait is as precious as knowing how to hunt. And being on time is not an exclusively British virtue. In England, as in any other part of Europe, natterjack toads show their good manners, especially when they have a date with the ladies. Contrary to popular belief, Many amphibians spend most of their time in dry and even arid places. They only come to the water once a year, when it's necessary to mate. Their appointments are scarce and short. They only meet for a few days. And each time the appointment must be set previously, so all of them can attend the party. In the two previous years, the appointment was for January 31st and February 7th. Things have changed a lot this time, especially regarding the atmospheric pressure and temperature. This year, the toads will arrive at the ponds on April 24th. The weather has gone crazy. However, having to wait is not habitual among toads. In this society, nobody arrives early or late. Genetic breeding among the best is at stake.
The males were the first to arrive, as it should be. They loudly proclaimed their superiority. They will spend one or two weeks croaking, waiting for a continuous line of females to approach their noisy pond. At night, directed by a weather station that analyzes weather, temperature, and humidity, the ladies come to the pond. Just for a day, for a few hours, and they'll spend only one night with their chosen mate, their warty knight in shining armor. After a long embrace that may last 20 hours, they won't visit any other pond until next year, when their calendar and inner clock tell them that it is the perfect date for egg laying. show an almost paranormal knowledge of meteorology. They always know when it's going to rain or when it's going to be sunny. In fact, some weather forecasts are based on watching how some living beings behave. Sometimes their appearance is the most trustworthy indicator of a change in environmental conditions. for example, are excellent weathermen. They usually wait for a storm to pass over to send their winged hordes to spread and reproduce. After the rain, the ground is softer and the females find it much easier to dig their nests. Therefore, it's most important to synchronize a breeding flight with a heavy rain. In a society of ants, soldiers and workers are not sexually defined. Only winged members are males or females and are the potential future queens and prince consorts. The raising of winged ants is controlled and timed precisely so that all of them mature at the same time. That way, they will have the most possibilities to have a successful mass fecundation. The precise agreement on time minimizes their exposure to predators. It's not easy to attack on so many fronts at the same time, and this ensures the survival of the greatest number of winged ants. The secret order that tells the ants when it's time to emerge from the ground is usually valid for many ant nests within the area, independent of their species. However, some other nests are not synchronized. It's likely that the reason for this lies in the form of another defense mechanism for the species. Man cannot accurately define the factors that trigger these procreative orgies. The accurate ants do not get confused. In fact, their behavior has made them one of the largest zoological families in the world. The so-called ant explosion happens once or twice a year, and it only lasts for a few minutes. After less than half an hour, nobody is left except one or two fertilized females that lose their wings and begin to dig their nests. As you can see, in the life of any being, there is a time to work, a time to feed, a time to breed, a time to stay, and a time to go. All these actions are cyclical and take place day after day, season after season. 
They are repeated following the pace set by the Earth's rotation and movements. Man has measured these cycles with clocks and calendars and translated them into years, months, days, and seconds. Since they are circular movements, it's not difficult for a wild animal to determine when a period is going to begin or to end. Even man finds it easy to recognize when a new summer starts or ends after feeling the rising or falling temperatures. But animals are much more accurate in their forecasts. They have amazing light and humidity detectors and accurate barometers and thermometers. And they perceive when the heat has arrived and it's time to migrate to colder areas. Migration is a key time, and not only in the life of a specific individual or a couple. It may be essential for the whole colony, or even an entire species. The meeting of thousands of migrating animals may end in mass crowds where all the members of a species can be found. Therefore, the decision when each seasonal migration should start is critical. How do they know when it's the time to leave? What tool gives them such accurate information? Who decides? The answer lies in the combination of several factors. On the one hand, most species are sensitive to photo periods, the amount of light that reaches the Earth every day. Of the 365 days which consist of 24-hour periods, it is only on March 21st when day and night last 12 hours each. All the other days, light and darkness last different numbers of hours. And the animals are aware of it. Migrating animals are necessarily much more sensitive to these differences and are able to recognize when summer or winter is approaching. They are also able to perceive the arrival of rain. They detect variations in humidity and air pressure as well as changes in the atmospheric electrical charge. As if they were living weather stations, migrating species carefully observe any indication that may help them decide it is the perfect time to start their long migration. When for some animals it is time to migrate, for other animals, changes in the weather bring about the powerful need to prepare a shelter for their future offspring. Hormone clocks have the same accurate effect on every zoological class, but they generate different results in each species depending on the season. Their inner clock has told these birds that it is time to build a nest. The family is going to grow soon. They have to take into account the real time each couple will have available for their task, as well as the time their eggs will take to hatch. As with any other class of animal, they have to make birth coincide with the season with the most available resources. Their building instinct has been triggered by an infallible alarm clock, sexual hormones. These hormones decide when the animals have to look for and choose a mate. They have worked hard building a nest, but they have also built closer links and ties that will turn their relationship into a stable one with sexual love and fertility the prerequisites to succeed genetically. 
usually results in an egg. Most animals have chosen a small safe to ensure the protection of their children. Although it's meant for more than just protection, it's designed in such a way as to let the individual develop inside. It feeds the embryo, it allows the exchange of gases, and stores the embryo's toxic waste so it doesn't harm it there's no better incubator. In certain zoological families, gender is established within the egg, depending on the incubating heat. At average heat levels, the hatching of males and females is balanced. But if the temperature rises or falls much over or below the average, the female to male ratio is different and determined by the conditions for survival in the ecosystem. In addition, the eggs of some species are prepared and programmed to start or stop depending on external environmental conditions. Some of them can remain in suspended animation and will hatch many years later when they detect a certain air pressure, certain rays of sunlight, or a certain percentage of humidity. Embryo development is weather synchronized so that children see the sunlight at the best possible moment. Once again, life is taken to the extreme and shows how it can manage time. Temporary biological suspension is also possible outside the egg. Sometimes the only opportunity to beat the environment is to stop the clock, to disconnect, to fall into a latent state until conditions are favorable once again. In almost every zoological class, we can find animals that hibernate or rest in summertime. In those moments, they don't waste energy and therefore don't need to feed. For other animals, these pauses imply different stages in their lives. Insects, for instance, must complete a metamorphosis before becoming adults able to reproduce, which starts the cycle again. For some time, they seem to be dead, but they wait, motionless and dry, for their transfiguration to occur. The time it takes depends, as always, on external factors such as temperature, sunlight, humidity, etc. After a few days or a few years, the larva changes into a new being, which appears at the appropriate time. It's life in installments. It's something that goes beyond all our dreams. We don't have the power to delay our own life. It's likely we will never have it. It may be because our soul is not designed to live forever, at least on this world. Nowadays, the freezing of embryonic or sexual cells and cloning could make, at least theoretically, a second life possible 
or make it easier to become parents after our deaths. But the methods to achieve this feat are questioned by society. While cryogenesis is still only possible for Sleeping Beauty. Life in suspended animation is the only way to cross gulfs in time. But what we find just impossible is quite natural for apparently simpler beings. The simple Artemia has gone beyond what we would call a pause in its biological cycle. Although they're not handsome, they're the main character of a real Sleeping Beauty story. Once upon a time, in southern Africa, a colony of Artemia laid their eggs before a dry period that lasted 100 years. Once the salt mine where the adults had lived dried, the eggs were scattered over the ground at the mercy of the elements. The eggs were smaller than the finest grains of sand and remained half buried in the dust. After the first few decades, it seemed that all trace of life had disappeared. However, its living spark was there, waiting. More than 100 years after the eggs were produced, the sky was gray and heavy over the thirsty ground. On that afternoon, the sky opened and it rained. The touch of raindrops on the eggs awoke them from their latent state and little by little returned them to the living world. A cascade of hormones was started inside the still living eggs. Just 1%, but it was enough to start again. With the sudden increase in humidity, the embryo development process was reactivated, a surprisingly fast process. In just a few hours, while the water level rose in the former salt mine ponds, thousands of minute Artemia larvae joined the party underwater. They were celebrating their own resurrection. They had vanquished time and were now ready to perpetuate themselves once again till the next drought. According to some studies, the temporary death-like stage of these crustaceans can span up to 1,000 years. For Artemia and some other extraordinary species, suspended life is not a linear process. That's why they break our traditional succession from birth, growth, reproduction, and death, called life. The ability to stop the life process and to reactivate it later and organize a biochemical device that can be restarted with just some drops of water or by a slight barometric variation, that represents the conquest of time. It's making fun of the clock, escaping death, and approaching eternal life. A dream is ancient as it is impossible for mankind. Eternity, however, is really seductive for man. We are the only animal that is aware that sooner or later, we are going to die. On our planet, the living beings that are the most similar to the concept of immortality are the beings that are the most different from Homo sapiens according to evolution. They are the most primeval living beings on the Earth. Bacteria. For three and a half billion years, each bacteria has split in two before its death. There are no parents, 
No children, no sex, just splitting. With time, bacteria may evolve, they may change, but they will be the original individual. The same individual that adjusts to the new ecosystems. It's a form of self-perpetuation. If the breed doesn't disappear, the bacteria will live forever and multiplied by 1,000. Some say that the first bacteria arrived on Earth from outer space. Whether this is true or not, no other living being could have withstood the trip better. Therefore, even if we discard the idea that bacterial life may live outside our blue planet, nowadays it's possible that we may be the ones that will export them. And that will be the fact, the only fact, that we will not have copied in one way or another from wildlife, from natural genius. <laughs>